right, Mayor Bennett, it looks like we have a quorum to get started here. All right, great, thanks, Aaron. Jim Healy's on the Jim Healy's on the call. Good morning, thank you. I'll call this meeting the order of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, first item, uh, which has been up on the screen. Again, if you're on the phone, you can use uh, star six to mute and unmute yourself. Aaron, you want to read the roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Mayor Bennett? Present. President Brawley? Jim Healy? Oh, you know what, I'm going the wrong direction. Present. Thank you. Um, Rita Athis? Present. Frank Beal? <clears throat> Present. President Brawley? Commissioner Cox? Mayor Darch? Here. And I got Jim Healy. Mayor Noak? Present. President Reinbold? Present. Mayor Rattering? Here. Carolyn Schofield? Here. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Here. Matt Walsh? Star six. Matt. I know he's on the phone. Yeah, what's happening with him? Matt, can you hear me? Thank there you. you. Go. Yep, we can hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. All right. It's Matt Walsh. I'm here. Thanks. <laughs> Diane Williams. Present. There is a quorum, and before you are the minutes of the uh, November 18th meeting, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Again, state your name in a second. Rita Athis, so moved. Right, Mayor, no. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Aaron, read the, read the uh, roll call, please. Yes, and just one moment before I do, I just want to note that as permitted by the governor's disaster declaration of January 8th, 2021, um, the determination has been made that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this board. So in order to ensure transparent and open meeting as possible, meeting materials were posted a week in advance. Um, and a recording of this meeting will be posted and linked on our website. All votes will be taken by roll call. So um, with that motion and second for the approval of the minutes, the roll call, Mayor Bennett? Aye. Rita Athis? Yes. Frank Beal? Uh, yes. President Brawley? Commissioner Cox? Mayor Darch? Yes. Jim Healy? Aye. Mayor Noak? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rottering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. The motion carries. And the motion carries. First item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Aaron. Yes, so um, thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, as we wrap up the year, we traditionally put together a printed annual report. Um, wanted to just mention like so many other aspects of our life, everything has gone virtual. So um, I hope you received our email earlier um, at the end of the, at the beginning of the year with our virtual um, video for our annual report. We, uh, if we have time, we'll play it at the end of the agenda here uh, or at the end of the meeting, but I wanted to get to some of the more meaty content that we have. Um, so with 2020 behind us, we are finalizing the draft of next year's budget and work plan. IDOT had requested that we advance our fiscal year 2022 unified work program budget submission to April 2021 to better align with the submission of other MPOs across the state. Um, so next month, the staff will be submitting for your review a draft of the FY 2022 annual comprehensive plan and UWP budget for your review. We'll present the final budget for your approval at the March board meeting to meet this time frame. So I know it seems like we just did this, but this will help us get better aligned and make sure our contracts are in order in time for us to kick off the, the fiscal year. So due to the year-long extension of the FAST Act, the federal transportation bill, our federal funding is unchanged from federal fiscal year 2021 levels of 18 million seven hundred eighty-eight thousand seven hundred and sixty-nine dollars um, oh, um, staff sent you a budget uh, that funds CMAP's MPO core activities with the work of the UWP partners and provide funding to explore the implications of COVID across the region. 
So just a friendly reminder that local dues are due January 31st, 2021. We've collected about 8% of our local dues from across the region. We recognize that we sent them out late. Everybody is sort of working in a remote capacity. So, you know, we'll continue to keep an eye on this and reach out to our partners to remind them. We'll be sending a reminder here uh, the first week of February. So um, one other note I regret uh, that I forgot, ne neglected to, to ask the non-voting members of the board for their, um, uh, whether or not they were present here. So um, just let me do that right now. Leanne Redden. Present. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Muhammad Adian. I'm here, please. Thank you. My apologies. Um, so a couple other notes here, new county board chairs across the region. Uh, since the November election, I've met with two of the three new county board chairs in our region. Um, I've met with Corinne Pirogue of Kane County and, and Michael Bueller in McHenry County. And I'll be meeting with Jennifer Bertino Tarrant of Will County later this week um, to talk to them a little bit about CMAP, their participation. They have a seat on the, um, the MPO policy committee as well as uh, you know, an important role in appointing members to this board as well. So I'm looking forward to working with each of them and, and talking to them about how you know, we can continue to work together as a region to address some of our most pressing challenges. So a, a couple items of note on call for projects. Last Friday, we opened the call for projects for our surface transportation program shared fund and congestion mitigation air quality program, the CMAC program and the transportation alternatives program. So these projects may address safety, transit, bicycle or pedestrian improvements across the region, um, traffic and freight movement, bridge and road reconstruction and vehicles um, and equipment that use alternative fuel sources. The deadline for applications is March 5th. Um, as the last time, uh, we are holding this via one call for projects and then the staff will evaluate the projects and determine which program they're best suited for uh, to make it easier for applicants. Um, additionally, uh, we will be holding a joint call for planning assistance with the Regional Transportation Authority, which will open January 20th and end February 3rd. Um, to best support the immediate needs of the region as a result of COVID, we're hosting a small invitational and really looking to prioritize awards based on community need this year. This year, communities will be able to apply for um, safety-related technical assistance, which is new. Um, and you'll hear more a little bit about safety and our commitment to safety um, on this agenda. But assistance will include developing design studies and action plans to address ve vehicular pedestrian and bicycle safety challenges in communities um, from impacts of grade crossings to intersection flooding and ADA compliance uh, challenges. And just a, a note on our commitment to safety here at CMAP, we're placing increased attention on traffic safety as we see the number of fatalities and crashes continue to increase across our region. We've left progress towards meeting our safety performance targets, which you'll hear more about on our agenda this morning. And so as part of our commitment to safety, we're kicking off a safety resource group um, later this month. And this group will really inform a, a regional safety action agenda to recommend safety improvements through the lenses of equity, engineering, education, enforcement, and emergency services and public health. This resource group uh, will include members from across these fields to prioritize action, to build consensus and develop safety tools and resources and develop shared policies for us and our regional partners. So again, um, you'll hear more about this, but it's a critical issue. The Transportation Committee um, asked that we do this um, and help convene our regional stakeholders around a safety action agenda to help us meet our, our safety targets, but also just to reduce fatalities um, and crashes across the region. Um, so then my last item of note here is on equitable engagement. I wanted to give you all a heads up about a proposal that we'll bring to you next month for approval. So at the beginning of the summer, we collectively put out a statement reconfirming our commitment as a board to equity. And one of the ways we want to meet this commitment is to have an inclusive process for incorporating stakeholder input. Um, and to make sure that that stakeholder input makes it into our plans and programs and helps shape them. So this includes engagement from community and grassroots partners. And I'll just recognize for a minute here, a step back that as the MPO, you know, we're beholden to the federal rules that help that are required um, for us to meet the federal environmental justice standards to meet Title VI, which is the Civil Rights Act you know, and to ensure that there isn't continued discrimination in the programs and the 
policies that we implement here at the regional level. So through this program and RFP that we're putting out, we will bring to you a proposal to develop a test pilot program and equitable engagement that will specifically address the challenges of engaging um, community and grassroots stakeholders in some of our planning projects. So with that, um, we can move on to the, uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them, but we can move on to the next item any, too. Any questions of Erin? Okay, we will move on. Under item five, it's the uh, annual uh, CMAP audit and financial report for the year ending June 30th, actually, 2020. Uh, Jim Savio, are you on? I'm here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks uh, everyone for your time today, appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I wanna start too by thanking um, Angela, uh, Molly and the entire staff for all of their assistance uh, throughout the entire audit process. It was obviously a very uh, unique year this year. Uh, we performed uh, the audit uh, entirely remotely. Um, so it was uh, uh, a little bit of a challenge, but uh, uh, Angela and the staff were really great about being responsive to our, to our questions. Uh, sometimes, you know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, but uh, they were really responsive, uh, got us all of our information that we needed. Uh, we were able to stay uh, on the audit schedule. So I wanna thank them for that. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of review the annual financial report and the independent auditors report, as well as the uh, communication to the board report, uh, and then uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I want to start uh, with the annual financial report and the independent auditors report. And what I'd like to do is kind of look at the table of contents. There's a lot of information in here, and I just want to kind of go through that and kind of point out what, what is all uh, in this report. So. On the table of contents um, in the annual financial report, uh, we start with the independent auditor's report and we'll look at that uh, in just a minute here. Um, after that are the general purpose external financial statements. Uh, we start with management discussion and analysis that we'll look at also. And then the basic financial statements. So these are your three main financial statements. Uh, the statement of net position or your balance sheet, uh, the statement of revenues, expenses and changes in net position or your income statement, uh, and then a statement of cash flows. And then after that, on pages seven through 33, uh, notes to the financial statements. So a whole lot of great additional information that kind of supports those basic financial statements uh, and should be read uh, in conjunction with it. Um, after that is required supplementary information or RSI, I may refer to it as. Uh, I wanna point out here, the RSI and then the MDNA, which is also considered RSI, uh, we perform limited procedures, but not enough to give an opinion on. So I just want to point that out. And that's uh, explained also in the independent auditor's report. Um, so the required supplementary information has information on your participation in the uh, Illinois uh, Municipal Retirement Fund, or IMRF, as well as the State Employees Retirement System, or SERS. Uh, and it also has some information on the, uh, your other post-employment benefit plan, or retiree health. Um, after that uh, supplementary information, uh, the first item on page 39 is the schedule of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position uh, budget versus actual. So that uh, gives you a report that shows you how you did versus your budget. Uh, and then after that, uh, a lot of additional information um, on your grant activity for the year. And then the very last section is the single audit section. Uh, because you expend more than $750,000 uh, in federal funds, you're required to have a single audit. So we issued two additional reports uh, in addition to the uh, independent auditor's report. Those are listed out on page 48 to 51. And then we have the schedule of expenditures of federal awards that shows you all of your expenditures for all of your federal awards. Uh, notes uh, to, the, the, to that schedule after that. And then a schedule of findings and questions, question costs, which is a, a summary uh, of the activity for the year. And we'll take a look at that because it uh, it's a little bit easier to understand than, than reading the, uh, the two reports. So uh, first item I like to look at uh, is the independent auditor's report. So this report and then the two single audit reports are what we are responsible for as auditors. Uh, management is responsible for the rest of the annual financial report. And those responsibilities are explained here on page one. Now on page two, up at the very top is the opinion paragraph, the paragraph that most people are uh, interested in. Uh, and again, this year we issued an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that we can provide to the agency. Now, after that, we had a change in accounting principle 
Uh, we adopted GASB Statement 84, Fiduciary Activities, and then GASB Statement 97, uh, which was an amendment uh, to GASB 84. Not a big change here. We just added a footnote for your defined contribution plan. So uh, not, a, not a huge change this year. Um, following the independent auditor's report is management discussion and analysis prepared by Angela. A great overview of the agency's financial position and changes in financial position. Um, it also highlights any uh, significant changes or trends that might be occurring in the, uh, uh, during the year. Uh, and it also has some three-year comparative data. So I tell you every year, if you only want to read one thing in the entire report, read this because it provides a good overview of the agency's finances. Now, after that, uh, we'll get into the financial statements now, uh, the basic financial statements. Uh, and on page four is your statement of net position. A couple of things I'll just point out here. Um, you'll see they're comparative, um, but uh, under long-term assets up at the top, the net pension asset for IMRF, you have an asset this year of about $26,000. That is a uh, change from the net pension liability that you had in the previous year, and that's down below under long-term liabilities. You'll see the, the liability last year was almost $2 million. So that flipped over to an asset of about $26,000 this year. Uh, that information is as of December 31st, 2019, because IMRF has a, a calendar year uh, for their, for their uh, plan year. And then right below that, capital assets also increased uh, a fair amount. Uh, that's due to uh, some of the activity related to the new office. So uh, some construction in progress, uh, as well as some uh, office equipment. So that increased uh, year over year. And then the last thing I'll point out on this report, well, two things. Under long-term liabilities, uh, the net pension liability for SERS uh, continues to decrease because your percentage uh, of, the, of the total plan keeps decreasing. So that decreased from about 5 million to about 4.5 million. So another positive trend there. And you can see the result of that uh, in the net position down at the very bottom. So this is your retained earnings. Um, you'll see the net investment in capital assets increased due to those uh, capital asset additions. But then the unrestricted net position also increased from 47,000 to a little over a million dollars. So a, a good portion of that's related to the positive uh, uh, positive trends in IMRF and SERS. Now the very next uh, statement on page five is the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. This is your income statement. Uh, just point out operating income year over year, uh, about 1.1 million last year, 1.7 this year. Again, that's, that's uh, somewhat due to the, uh, the positive uh, pension fund info. And then the change in net position uh, is down at the bottom. That's your net income. And you'll see it. that was pretty consistent. The only change is adding in the investment income for the year. Uh, on the very next page is the statement of cash flows. So this basically shows cash inflows and cash outflows by activity. And one thing, again, I'll point out the cash flows from capital and related financing activities up at the top, the acquisition of capital assets, obviously that's due to the capital asset additions this year, the, the cash outflow for that. Uh, now I want to go to the required supplementary information, and I'm going to start on page 36. But I like to every year just go through the, the funded status of, the, of, the, uh, of both uh, IMRF and SERS. And like I mentioned before, page 36 just gives you your funded status. Um, and you'll see, like I said, that the trend uh, is uh, pretty positive. You've, you've been um, funded over 90% all six years. And you'll see that about halfway down the page, the plan fiduciary net position as a percentage of total pension liability. That percentage has been above 90%. Uh, in three years, it was over 100%, including this year. So uh, very well funded. And now some similar information for the state employee retirement system is on page 37. And you'll see that very first line is the employer's proportionate share of net pension liability. That's what I mentioned earlier, your proportion, it keeps decreasing. So as a result, your proportion of the liability keeps decreasing as well. And you can see that on the very next line. And then the last line is uh, basically the funded status for the, for the entire plan. And you'll see that's pretty much hovered around 30 to 35% for the entire year. So, you know, when you compare that to IMRF, which is about 100%, you can see the difference in the funding for both of the plans. So uh, 
After that, I just want to point out the state schedule of expenditures of federal awards that starts on page 52. So that's 52 and 53. That basically just gives you a detail of um, all of your federal expenditures by program. Uh, and you'll see the very first uh, program uh, highway uh, planning and construction 20.205. That was the major fund for this year. And that was about $16 million of the total uh, expenditures of federal awards of about 17 and a half million. And you can see that on page 50. And then the last thing I'll go over in this report is the schedule of findings and question costs. This gives you a really good summary of, uh, of the results of both the financial audit as well as the single audit. And you'll see the very first section, the financial statements. Again, like I said previously, you have an unmodified opinion. Uh, and there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. And then no uh, non-compliance that was material to the financial statements. And then on the federal award side, right after that, again, no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Uh, and we give an unmodified opinion on the highway planning and construction uh, major program. Uh, also no audit findings. And then at the very last line, uh, you guys did qualify as a low risk auditee. So um, slightly less testing uh, because of that. And then the very last page just shows you um, the results of the financial statement findings for this year, federal awards findings uh, for this year, as well as the prior year. You'll see we had no, no findings at all. So um, that's all I had on the annual financial report. I just wanna go over the board uh, communication reports real quick. That's the auditor's communication to the members of the board. And again, I'll go through the uh, uh, table of contents real quick. We have to have some required communication with the board every year uh, in accordance with auditing standards. So pretty routine this year, that's on pages two through six, uh, pretty routine communication. We didn't have any disagreements with management or any delays. So uh, we do communicate that we uh, implemented those two pronouncements, GASB 84 and 97. Uh, but otherwise, like I said, uh, pretty standard uh, lang uh, language and communication there. Now, after that, we are required to communicate to you any audit adjusting journal entries that we found. These are entries uh, that we found during the audit process. Uh, we had six entries. Those are listed on page five and six. And I want to point out too, we had no what we call past adjusting journal entries. So these would be entries that were um, uh, deemed to be immaterial, so they weren't recorded. So we didn't have any past adjustments. So everything that needed to be adjusted, we adjusted uh, in those adjusting journal entries on pages five and six. And then the very last thing, the management letter starts on page seven. And if we go to page eight, page eight is the management letter. And basically this says in writing that we had no material weaknesses. So this is in accordance with auditing standards as well. And then the status of the prior year comments, uh, I should point out too, we had no new deficiencies this year. Um, and then the status of the prior year comments is on page 12. So those two, we did have two uh, entries in total that we had to make this year. So we consider those to be still applicable this year. So um, with that, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, the board may have. Any questions to the board? Again, other than to uh, thank sta uh, staff, uh, as we all know, the mix of various uh, funds coming from various uh, uh, places uh, to again, have a, a clean audit is great. And I thank our staff and certainly thank our auditors for uh, working with us on, on giving us uh, this report. Again, any questions? I'll entertain a motion in that we accept the audit and financial uh, report for the year uh, as a form of a motion. Uh, Darge, so moved. Oh, moved. Got to. second. Moved and seconded. Aaron, call the roll, please. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Rita Athis. Yes. Frank Beal. Yes. President Brawley. Commissioner Cox. Mayor Darch. Yes. Jim Healy. Aye. Mayor Noak? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rattering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Mayor, could you just say hello? I'm the court reporter. 
Yes. Oh, thank you, Anne. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, Matt Walsh? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. And the motion carries. Moving on to the next item on the agenda under procurements and contract approvals, Angela. Okay, I had to unmute myself. I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, CMAP board. Happy New Year. Um, for um, this month, we only have one procurement, um, and we'll be bringing more next next month. Uh, today, I'm seeking approval to enter into a contract with RSG for the activity-based update project with a vendor limit for an amount not to exceed $499,212. So with that, I'm asking. Is there any questions on the contract? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept. Ryan Bolt, so moved. Diane Williams, second. Moved and seconded. Aaron, call the roll, please. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Aye. Rita Athis. Yes. Frank Beal. Yes. President Brawley. Commissioner Cox. <laughs> Mayor Darch. Yes. Jim Healy. Aye. Mayor Noak? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rottering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Diane Williams? Yes. The motion carries. Next item on the committee reports, Aaron. Great. Uh, per CMAP bylaws and the chairman delegation, my recommendation for CMAP's working committee membership and 2021 meeting dates is outlined in the memo included in your packet. Um, also, the MPO bylaws assert that CMAP must name its representatives to the MPO policy committee in January. This year, the two members are Frank Beal and Matt Brawley. Uh, Rita Athis and John Noak will serve as their alternates in the event that they are unable to attend those meetings. The, the policy committee meets tomorrow. So at this point, um, just wanted to uh, inform you of the, the meeting schedule and the, the committee membership. Very good. Thank you. Under the uh, UWP, Angela, back to you again. Thank you, Chairman. Um, some of this will be a repeat of what, what Aaron mentioned, uh, but I'll, I'll go through it anyway. For your review and outline in the memo is a copy of the FY22 UWB, UWP budget process. As Aaron mentioned, at the request of IDOT to uh, better align the, the uh, submission of CMAP's budget with the timeline of other MPOs in the region, a final version of our budget is due to IDOT on April 1st, as opposed to June. Um, as a result, the final budget will be submitted to the board in March for approval. To expedite the budget process at the October UWP committee meeting, the committee adopted an accelerated schedule for development of the budget and voted only to conduct a core program this year. The committee will use uh, this time through, the, uh, through March to review the competitive program to seek opportunities for efficiency for the FY23 program. Um, as Aaron mentioned, the earmark is unchanged uh, from the F, uh, F, FY 2021 budget. Um, November, the UWP committee members submitted core proposals for consideration. This afternoon, the committee will vote on the 22 program, and uh, that will be submitted to the board in draft form next month. Uh, on the last page of the memo provided is the schedule for this year's program and when it will be submitted to other committees for consideration. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions of Angela? Uh, yeah, this is, a, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, some clarification and a general comment. The clarification is you list Metro twice and in, in the list of seven agencies i assume that's the rta is the seventh one in the middle of the memo um that's definitely an error they're only on there once uh this year only core proposals were submitted so rta was not included in this year's plan so i'll go back and look at the memo but metro should only be on there once well uh, under option two it says cmap paste metro 
COM, CDOT, CTA, and Metro. Yeah, that's a typo. I'm sorry. It's what? It's a typo. Metro shouldn't be in there twice. So are there seven or eight? Because you got eight applications. So there's seven. There's seven committee members that make up the UWP. But you got so eight applications. So it's the it's Pace, Metra. Typically, uh, RTA joins us if we have a competitive program. Uh, there's CMAP, of course. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing the counties, the Council of Mayors, um, and typically a county response. So there should be seven. But I'll, I'll look again to see where the air is. But there's seven committee members. OK. Uh, but the, the, the larger question is that it, this seems to be trending toward a, a, a formula-based allocation of dollars uh, rather than something that's more performance-based. Uh, am I reading that right? Uh, is there any, you list priorities, but what's the follow-up with, with those who receive the funds? So, CMAP, CMAP is strongly committed to formula-based, I mean, to a performance-based allocation of scarce dollars, and certainly we have scarce dollars, and this seems to be trending toward formula-based rather than performance-based. So I'll let Aaron definitely chime in, but for, for this fiscal year, it does seem more formula-based. We didn't have a competitive program, which um, is an important component of the performance-based element of the program. The committee this year through June would like to really e evaluate the competitive program since that is primarily performance-based, but the goal is not to make it a formula-based program. This is just an anomaly based on the fact that we have a condensed timeline, an expedited timeline to get IDOT a budget, and also at the request of Federal Highways, uh, FTA, and IDOT, we want to revisit the competitive program and see if we can look for opportunities for efficiency. But it, I would agree this year it's formula based, but that's not the long term uh, focus of the program. And that's good to hear. Thank you. Also chime in here on that point too. You know, the competitive program has a five year spend rate. And I think one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we're thinking about how we get those federal dollars moving faster. Um, it's been a, a challenge, I think, for us and for the, the folks that oversee those dollars. So as we go back and look at what a good core competitive, a like good competitive program looks like, we want to take into consideration how we can get those dollars moving faster. Because I think what we've typically seen is projects that we'd award one year don't start to spend until year three or year four of that grant that they received too. So I think that's one of the things that we want to make sure as we go back and look at a performance-based program that we can get those dollars moving faster. Thank you. Le Leanne, did you have a question? Um, actually, Frank kind of raised my my comments um, that we as a region, and I know you know RTA is working very hard to even uh, turn the Titanic, if you will, and move further away from um, formula based funding. And so I just wanted to echo that concern. Um, I wanted to make, I guess, good to hear that maybe that this is a one time anomaly, um, and not to sort of. Uh, start a trend of going in back to old, old ways uh, when we'd made efforts to create a competitive program. And the rest of us are all looking to even find further ways of creating competitive programs across our funding sources. So uh, just echoing uh, Frank's comments as well. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to uh, item nine, the semi-annual uh, onto 2050 tip conformity analysis and tip amendment, Russell. Included in your packet today is the ONTU 2050 TIP Conformity Analysis and TIP Amendment 21-02. Uh, as you know, CMAP, the CMAP region is a non-attainment area for ozone. Thus, we are required to demonstrate that projects in the TIP conform to the motor vehicle emissions budget for our area through a regional emissions analysis. Uh, specifically, projects in the TIP subject to air quality analysis must demonstrate when modeled that the region is not exceeding our motor vehicle emissions budget which is shown near the end of your memo. Uh, the memo includes information about new projects along with various changes to existing projects that are part of the regional air quality analysis and was subject to a 30-day public comment period from November 2nd to December 3rd, 
during which time CMAP did not receive any comments. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, we made some changes to the memo. We now um, we are now including greenhouse gas on road mobile source emission results as an informational item, similar to what we do for PM 2.5. Uh, the region is in attainment for the PM 2.5 standard, but at one time we did have a budget to adhere to, which is shown in the memo. However, for GHG emissions, no such historical budget exists. Uh, the reduction goal shown is really just a little more than uh, some back of the envelope stuff that CMAP stuff put together to provide some context. Uh, the key information here is that for mobile source GHG emissions, this is our baseline for where we are today. Uh, we, we do plan to do some work to develop actual targets and compare where we are to those targets, but actual targets don't exist at this time. Uh, in conclusion, our analysis demonstrates that the semi-annual ONTO 2050 TIP conformity analysis and TIP Amendment 21-02 are found to conform to the motor vehicle emissions budget for our region. Uh, staff requests approval of the semi-annual ONTO 2050 TIP conformity analysis and TIP Amendment 21-02 as presented. Uh, if there are any questions, I can answer them at this time. Seeing no questions, I'll entertain a motion that we accept it. No motion to approve. Second, Darge. Moved and seconded. Aaron, please call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Yes. Rita Athos. Yes. Frank Beal. Yeah, yes. President Brawley. Commissioner Cox. Mayor Darch? Yes. Jim Healy? Aye. Mayor Nope? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rattering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Aaron, Matt texted me, he got cut off, so he votes aye. Diane Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next item is the uh, CMAP Highway Safety Targets. Erin? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier um, in my remarks, the fatalities and crashes across our region are up, and you know, the FHWA has put in place new performance measures that the region is to work together with IDOT to address these issues. And so as we think about how we begin to, to do this, I think you'll see some stark numbers today, and I think they're, they're concerning for all of us. And so we as the MPO are thinking about what it is that we can do to effectively change these numbers for the better. Um, and so there are sort of two lines of thinking and important aspects, the engineering aspect, but also the behavioral aspect is critically important. Um, and I know if you've been paying attention to the news, there have been a number of articles about, you know, speed increases with traffic being down and that being a contributor. So this isn't just happening in our region, it's happening in all regions. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'd like to turn it over to, to Todd and to Vicki to walk you through not only the highway safety targets that we need your approval on, but a little bit of what it is we are going to do proactively to, to begin to talk about how we address these issues in the region. So with that, um, Todd? Or is it Vicki first? Yes, Sorry. yes, I'll jump in first. Yes, thank you, Erin. Um, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, my name is Vicki Jacobson. I joined CMAP in September of last year. Um, I'm a transportation planner with a background in multimodal transportation planning and policy work. Um, my work at CMAP will focus on safety for the near term, specifically our new regional traffic safety action agenda, which Aaron just referred to. And I'm gonna provide a brief introduction to the highway safety performance targets, which Todd will present shortly. Thanks for allowing me the time to talk about this important new work. So the CMAP safety action agenda is a response to a number of concerning trends and emerging needs in our region, which I'll go over here briefly. Um, as Aaron pointed out, traffic fatalities are on the rise in our region. They've trended upwards um, since about 2014 after decades of relative decline. Um, this fact alone merits, um, merits kind of digging into this topic. Um, as also mentioned, CMAP has a federal mandate to set traffic safety targets, which we are not meeting. Um, and the Transportation Committee has been clear in wanting us to, do, um, to address this. Um, in addition, um, there is a sense that effective and consistent safety programs may be 
needed by local governments in our region. Um, data show that a majority of crashes occur on local and county roads in our region. So um, we're looking for an opportunity to support um, that trend as well in terms of improving safety. Um, safety, which is already a complex topic with many dimensions to it, um, is also evolving as an equity issue, um, not just in our region, but nationally. Um, so it's critical, traffic safety is a critical issue in neighborhoods of color and enforcement of traffic safety laws often results in outcomes far worse than they were intended to solve. So we want to address this issue comprehensively with um, emerging needs. And of course, COVID has spun some things on its head as well. So uh, there's a new post pandemic mobility um, aspect here that we want to consider as we as we position ourselves to recover from this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, you know, we're seeing growing interest in active transportation modes in our region, and um, they're particularly vulnerable to traffic safety issues. So we want to address that as well. Next slide, please. I'm just going to quickly go over some of the, the larger trends that we're tracking and Todd will dig into these a little bit more. Um, so related to, we've seen an upward trend in the five year average, which is the red dotted line shown here on the graph. Um, it has started to trend upward since about 2014. This is the number of traffic related fatalities in the CMAP region. And this is the impetus in large part for the work that we're starting today or this month. Um, next slide, please. And also deeply concerning is the fact that bicyclists and pedestrians represent a growing number of the traffic fatalities in our region. These vulnerable modes, meaning unprotected by a vehicle shell, are particularly susceptible to vehicle speeds of over 30 miles per hour. Um, they're affordable, sustainable, active modes of transport that are a benefit to our region in so many ways. And we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect them and make them safe on our roadways. So we're still kind of untangling why those numbers are moving the way they are. But right now I'm going to pause and have Todd share with you for your approval, the highway safety performance targets. And I'll return afterwards and tell you a little bit more about the action agenda. Thank you, Vicki. Good morning. Uh, today, I'm going to go over the 2021 highway safety performance targets. The Transportation Performance Management Rule, or TPM, is intended to track national goals at the state and regional level for safety, asset condition, system performance, and congestion management air quality, or CMAC. TPM requires agencies to track system performance over time and evaluate the effectiveness of policies, plans, and programs in meeting or not meeting its targets. The safety rule requires state DOTs and MPOs to establish highway safety targets as five-year rolling averages on all public roads for five performance measures that include the number of fatalities, the rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled or VMT, the number of serious injuries, the rate of serious injuries per 100 million VMT, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. The MPO is required to support the state DOT's targets or establish its own targets. Highway safety targets are set each year, and this is the fourth year of setting highway safety targets. The CMAP board and MPO policy committee has supported IDOT's targets the last three years. The MPO is required to show how it's planning and programming to help achieve the safety targets. This is accomplished through integrating the targets into the transportation improvement program or TIP, the long range plan and other MPO planning activities. Each year, FHWA will perform an assessment of the state's performance and determine if the targets were met or if the state made significant progress towards meeting its targets. FHWA will evaluate the MPO performance during its certification review. Next slide, please. Each year, the FHWA evaluates whether states met or made significant progress towards meeting their targets. FHWA will consider states to comply if they achieve their targets or improve from the baseline at least four of the five required safety performance targets. Unfortunately, IDOT did not meet any of its 2018 targets, but it didn't make significant progress towards the two serious injury targets. Because IDOT did not meet or make progress on at least four targets, IDOT will be required to use all highway safety improvement program or HSIP funds for only safety projects and develop an HSIP implementation plan. Next slide, please. 
The table on this slide shows IDOT's statewide 2021 highway safety targets and the five-year average for the performance measures from 2015 to 2019. CMAP share is included under the state's numbers for reference. IDOT uses a policy-based 2% reduction in the five-year average or a trend line, analysis to set it, trend line analysis to set its safety targets. IDOT uses the method that results in the greatest decreases to set the targets. This year, all five performance measures use the policy-based 2% reduction so that tells you that the trend is probably not looking good for the performance measures. It's hard to see the trends we are experiencing, so the next few slides will provide a better picture of the trends. Next slide, please. The 2021 statewide fatality target is an even 1,000. This represents a 2% annual reduction in the 2015 to 2019 five-year average. This graphic shows the fatality trends for the state in blue and the CMAP region in red, with IDOT's past targets displayed as purple diamonds. The lighter colored lines are the annual totals and the darker lines are the five-year average. The five-year average is used for the target setting process to smooth out the randomness of the annual fluctuations we see in the data. The five-year average for both the state and CMAP region are trending up, even though the number of fatalities bounce up and down annually. Next slide, please. The 2021 statewide serious injury target is 11,556.4. Like fatalities, this represents a 2% annual reduction in the 2015-2019 five-year average. This graphic is formatted similar to the last with statewide data in blue and CMAP region in red. Unlike fatalities, the five-year average for the number of serious injuries is trending slightly down for the state and CMAP region. Next slide, please. The 2021 statewide non-motorized serious injuries and fatality target is 1,517.6. Like all the other targets, this represents a 2% annual reduction in the 2015 to 2019 average. The slide is a good example of the randomness of data on an annual basis and why the five-year average is used for target setting. You see a sharp increase in 2015, then another sharp decrease in 2016, and an increase in 2017. The majority of the state's total of non-motorized serious injuries and fatalities happen in the CMAP region, and the five-year trend for both the state and CMAP are trending up in alarming rate. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the MPO and board support IDOT's policy-driven 2021 highway safety targets. IDOT's safety targets reflect the need for and a commitment to reducing fatal and serious injury crashes. By supporting IDOT's targets, the region will have a unified goal that supports making the roads safer for all users. The graphic on this slide shows the number of fatal crashes in the CMAP region on state and local jurisdiction roads from 2015 to 2019. I put this graphic in as a reminder that we all need to work together to achieve not only the safety targets, but a safer system for everyone. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Vicki to talk about CMAP's efforts to help IDOT reach its safety targets and make roads safer for all users. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, so as we just saw, we're not meeting our targets. We have kind of two options. Um, one option is to um, you know, raise the targets and, and kind of allow for more traffic fatalities and injuries, but that's not our approach. Um, we would like to um, develop an action program to address traffic safety and reduce the number of fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. So the mission of our new regional traffic safety action agenda is to address regional traffic safety in a comprehensive, equitable, data-driven and collaborative way and this is kind of new territory for MPOs to take action on safety in the way that we are um, approaching it right now. We, we um, may be kind of paving a, a new territory here for um, MPOs to um, be a leader in this. Um, we are going to center all of this work around CMAP's core values, our implementation levers. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we do wanna find out ways where CMAP can have the most influence and the most impact on improving traffic safety. And of course, the work that was done to, um, in framing the ONTO 2050 plan, um, we intend to center the work on the safety action agenda around um, the core principles of the ONTO 2050. And finally, um, we see this as a partnership for the long term. We hope that our work in the next year or two lays a strong foundation for broader awareness and action regarding traffic safety in our region. And that one day we have a, a, a very strong coalition on traffic safety in our region. Next slide, please. 
Um, there are four primary components of this safety action agenda where, um, as we've mentioned, we're kicking off this month with a resource group, which will meet before, um, before the end of the month this, here in January. It includes stakeholders from the many different aspects of, of traffic safety, engineering, equity, education, public health, advocacy, and enforcement. This group will help inform the research analysis and best practices um, in our region's safety issues. Um, we will you know, use data that we already have and explore the opportunity to get new data and information regarding safety. You know, there's, there's a whole host of you know, connected device data available to us and we're gonna explore the potential for understanding traffic safety concerns there. Um, and look at best practices, both in the, at the federal level and at the local level to see where CMAP can have the greatest influence. Um, we also um, have, want to get some on the ground practice straight away. So this month also kicks off a Floss, the Village of Flossmoor local road safety plan, um, where we hope to get kind of real life experience on what local municipalities need in terms of improving traffic safety. And then finally, the end goal of this, in addition to the coalition, is to develop kind of like a, a resource kit and many tools and maybe some policy and design guidance for our region to have a really broad impact on safety um, in a systemic and proactive way. So that summarizes our safety action agenda. I welcome your input. Um, our contact information is here. Feel free to reach out with questions or if you wanna talk about anything in, in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. <clears throat> uh, questions? I, I just have one in the breakdown of, of the fatal crashes, did, did you mention or disseminate whether it's truck, truck car, car car? Uh, will, you, will that be part of your analysis? Ye, yes, we do, we do have that data. I, I'm i not gonna pretend to know the number offhand, but we do have it and it will definitely be part. Commercial traffic is yeah. a key component and we have a representative from the Illinois Trucking Association in our resource group. Obviously I mentioned that because of, of the recommendations uh, and whether obviously the research determines, you know, how and when or why uh, commercial versus you know, just vehicle or regular vehicle uh, has shown some pattern right. uh, or not, whether it's increased truck traffic, if it's uh, speed, et cetera. Yes, exactly. Jerry, uh, Karen Darch, a question. I wonder if there's anybody from that DuPage Rail Safety Council that might be um, on the committee, not necessarily for the rail aspect, but just because they've been doing something similar with data and info and whatever's out there um, for a few years now. So just a thought. Yes, they're on our radar for sure. Yes, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Other questions? Just a comment, um, thank you, that was great. Uh, you know, uh, in Chicago, we've been seeing a lot, I think because a lot of the roads are open, we're seeing a lot of uh, vehicles um, speeding, particularly, you know, we have some racing going on on the Dan Ryan and Lower Wacker. And so we've been really working internally to figure out um, different ways, um, you know, using our hardscapes as well as different policy decisions to try to kind of curb some of that. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with just people um, wanting to, you know, what we're seeing are people wanting to speed because there aren't as many people on the road and uh, you're able to do it. So um, certainly hoping um, that some of our strategies are, are um, effective, but also as people start, you know, we start reopening the city and the state, um, we see sort of a decline in this area. So thank you for this. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'll entertain a motion that we uh, approve the uh, 2021 highway safety targets. Is there a motion? Uh, Ath is so moved. Second. No, second. Moved and seconded. Call the roll, please. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Rita Athis? Yes. Frank Field? Yes. President Brawley? Oh, no, President Brawley? Commissioner Cox? Mayor Dart? Yes. Jim Healy? Aye. Mayor Noak? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rattering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Mayor Walsh? Or, I'm sorry, Matt Walsh. 
He again texted me. He's, his, his is an I. Okay. Um, Diane Williams. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to item 11, mo mobility recovery, Erin. Yeah, so, um, you know, another, we have a very transportation heavy themed uh, agenda today, but there's a lot of um, sort of spillover effects as we think about how people move and how we think about economic recovery related to our transportation systems here in the region. So we have a quick recorded presentation um, to, to make sure that we stay on time here, that we'll go through here and start play. But after, uh, I'd like to have a brief discussion with you to better understand what issues or concerns you all may have um, and hear what you all think um, are key areas of, of, of uh, key areas of concern for you and your communities and where we should be focused as we think about, you know, eventual recovery and, and how we think about mobility in the future of our region. So with that, Michelle, if you could play the video. Thank you for allowing me the time to provide some information and insight on the exciting new initiative CMAP has begun. We look forward to hearing your feedback and insights on this work today. As you all know, our transportation system is the backbone of our region. Our multimodal network does more than allow for a daily commute. It keeps America's supply chain running and it can be an economic ladder of opportunity if it connects people to good jobs. Our region's economy is interconnected through our transportation system. Prior to the stay-at-home orders, most workers in the Chicago region commuted across county boundaries every day knitting our communities together into a metropolitan economy. Our county board chairs and the city of Chicago's COVID-19 recovery task force recognize that our transportation system level challenges must be addressed at a regional scale and have asked CMAP to coordinate these efforts. To understand our current challenges, CMAP has been actively monitoring and reporting on the travel trends of our region since March, which has led to numerous questions and concerns that necessitate that we develop a strategy and action plan. We know that passenger vehicle trips, shown here in blue, were down more than 40% in April, but as of this fall, had almost recovered to March levels. In contrast, we have already seen truck traffic surpass where it was in 2019. We will need to address anticipated congestion on our roadways in this work. We also know that the pandemic did not improve the safety of our streets. By the end of 2020, the state of Illinois had over 100 more fatalities than 2019, rising over 1,000 in total. This chart demonstrates the rise in bike and pedestrian crashes in Chicago alone in 2020. Transit sustainability is an obvious concern for all of us. While we've seen a rebound in auto trips, system-wide transit ridership remains close to 75% below 2019. Our agency partners are working to both combat the day-to-day -day challenges of operating during pandemic, as well as trying to plan for the period of recovery that will follow. The funding and sustainability of the system is of critical importance to all of us. We can't continue to address our mobility systems as business as usual, or assume that trends and patterns will go back to where they were in 2019. Even before the COVID crisis, our region faced significant challenges to fully funding the transportation system and ensuring equitable access. The pandemic has put many of these issues under a microscope. CMAP has brought on a consultant team to work with us to help the region understand the impacts of the crisis and put forward an actionable plan to keep the region on track towards meeting the goals of ONTO 2050. The work will look specifically at ways to mitigate a likely rebound in congestion, sustain the transit system beyond the recovery phase, and increase the overall resilience of the region's multimodal transportation system. We'd like to tell you more specifically about what this initiative will entail. The main deliverables will utilize information on national and international mobility system solutions that are potentially applicable to the Chicago context. It will characterize COVID-related changes in employment, real estate markets, and travel preferences, bringing needed insight into land use and behavioral changes that occurred since and potentially after COVID. This research will inform CMAP modeling of regional travel in the short and medium term. Modeled results will then be used to characterize possible travel demand management strategies, 
which will then be matched to the most appropriate markets in our region. We anticipate this work to be dynamic and iterative in order to assist our partners, implementers, and decision makers in having information they need in the short and long term to address mobility issues. The final deliverable will gather these findings and culminate in an immediate and implementable action plan that outlines how the region can continue to advance the shared goals of ONTO 2050 in light of the current challenges. It will also align with the timing of our 2050 update in fall 2022, ensuring that we're moving ultimately towards a stronger 2060 plan. The backbone of these efforts will be a steering committee that will provide our team ongoing feedback and will be comprised of representatives of the MPO policy committee members, civic and community organizations, as well as the business community. We'll be reaching out to our partners to convene this group in the coming weeks. To help us be successful in this work, we are pleased to have selected AECOM Technical Services, who have partnered with Transmart EJM and the Center for Neighborhood Technology to undertake this project. The AECOM team brings a wealth of national experience working on the development of travel demand strategies in different regions, as well as a suite of recent work related to COVID impacts on transportation networks in major metropolitan cities. This includes scenario planning analysis for New Jersey Transit and Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, as well as a return to work plan for SEPTA in Philadelphia. The team has also recently completed work on multimodal mobility planning, such as the Colorado Smart Mobility Plan and CT rides with the Connecticut Department of Transportation. TransSmart EJM will contribute as a subconsultant to the policy and strategy development and CNT has been brought onto the team to bring voices to the table that have not historically been included in government decision making, continuing CMAP's commitment to equity and transportation planning. The CMAP staff working on this project are cross divisional and will be led by our principal, Elizabeth Scott, and project manager, Stephanie Levine. We are excited to initiate this project and know it will be a resource for our implementing partners and for our region as a whole to address our mobility concerns now and post COVID. We know that our work will ultimately impact air quality, access to jobs and opportunity growth in our region. We look forward to getting your input today and support as the work continues. Thank you. Erin. Yeah, so, you know, I hope that gives you a good overview of what it is that we hope to tackle um, this year. And it's, uh, it's not a small effort, but I do think that it's really important that we hear from you all because you are living in, in various parts of the region so that we can sort of bring that perspective back to this project and make sure we're, we're addressing needs that are, that are helpful to you and your communities and the work that you have going on. So I'm interested in, in thoughts on the project or um, specific areas of focus that you have for us. Comments? None being? You know, uh, Mayor Bennett, this is Carolyn Schofield. Yes. I, I'm just curious, you know, we were meeting um, with, with our health department and I'm assuming everyone else is kind of getting the same information from, from theirs as well. And, 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 you know, as much as we'd like to, to get to work on trying to get back to normal and figuring out the effects of COVID, I mean, what we're seeing is that we're not going to really even be there for, you know, another eight to 12 months and figuring out. And I'm wondering how that timeline fits in with this, Erin, you know, as, as much as we'd like to see, are, are we truly going to even be able to start those discussions and realize the impacts that we have any time in the near future? Yeah, I think that, that that's a great question. And I, I, you know, we have kicked this around a lot in the office. I think one of the things that we want to do is make sure that in eight to 12 months, you know, we've been working closely with the RTA. There's some significant challenges that transit will face if there isn't additional funding for transit. But then are there things that we could have put in place or that we wanted to fix about our transportation system that was going on prior to the pandemic that we can sort of build into our recovery plans? For instance, you know, could we be thinking about, you know, how different fares and fees work um, for transportation? Should we be thinking about, you know, con congestion pricing is something that this agency has had in a number of its plans. You know, how do we continue to think about congestion pricing if congestion increases? And 
uh, what are the policies that we put in place to make sure that the funding is not just to raise revenues to pay off other debt, that it's really about raising revenues to support uh, additional transit access service for, for people to get to different job centers across the region. Those are the types of things that we're sort of thinking about here. Hey, thanks. Any other questions? Um, Jerry, this this is Karen. Uh, yes. It kind of this kind of goes into one of the next items on the uh, state agenda and the vehicle miles traveled pilot um, that I that we're supporting, and sort of to Carolyn's same point. Uh, mass transit transit is huge out here. We have acres of metro parking lots. I can't wait for transit um, to be back, metro to be back at, at full steam. It's our hope, but it may or may not happen. And so um, th since things are a little weird, probably for the next several months, as Carolyn was pointing out, and I don't know when we can expect to see more of a return, it picks up. Um, but if there were a vehicle miles traveled pilot done over that same period, I would think, um, I'm not sure exactly what's what will be um, assessed in that, what, what the vehicles are, whether they're trucks or cars, but those might be askew given that there are probably people in vehicles and may stay in vehicles for a while, depending on how safe they feel, um, who may return to transit or not. Um, so anyway, that's just um, something I'm throwing out there. And, and I'll, I'll say this now, so I don't have to say it again in the next piece, but on that vehicle miles traveled, obviously a concern for those of us who live out in um, suburbia and Carolyn's neck of the woods and where we have people reliant on, on vehicles. If there's um, any look in that pilot as to what type of vehicle it is and in terms of, of an equitable apportionment of our roadway system, if there's a higher charge for say trucks that are um, now really um, all over the place with our Amazon deliveries and so forth, um, delivering goods necessarily to people who may not even own a vehicle um, and therefore uh, their equitable portion of the roadway cost somehow figured into that assessment of, of the vehicle of the type of vehicle that's traveling and what it's doing and who's benefiting from that as well as the individual um, vehicle owners who have to use them by necessity out here. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mary, bring up a couple of good points. Uh, one I pointed out earlier about truck traffic and in seeing some of the graphs, it almost seems uh, that I, I don't want to use the word normal, but they're out there and you can see it's come to a level pre pre COVID that certainly could be an analysis that we are back to a normal truck uh, traffic uh, situation you know, versus vehicle. And, and again, I think, uh, in, in another area about economic development, uh, the question going forward and whether we're able to work with the city of Chicago or uh, all those uh, around us with regarding reverse traffic on businesses is getting an idea about businesses requiring employees, you know, to, uh, to come back or whether we are gonna see a different future about uh, people working at home. I think that's, that's still an outlier that, you know, we're looking at, but you bring up a good point about what's real and what's not. And, and uh, I certainly think based on those charts that truck traffic is, is almost back, uh, back to normal. And I'll just note that um, small truck traffic is actually 10% above what's normal at this point in time. And we've seen that trend for about the past six to nine months or so. So, you know, as, as consumers uh, recognize the convenience of getting things delivered and not having to spend time, you know, going to the store, parking, walking in, getting one thing, forgetting something, right? Um, you know, it, what percentage of that 10% is going to be here to stay is something we're, we're definitely paying attention to. Great. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on to the last item on the agenda, that's state and federal legislative agenda. Erin? Yes, so um, before Tim and Anthony go over the agenda recommendations this uh, morning, I wanted to just take a moment and frame the documents in the context of our priority areas and the sorts of policy changes that we're seeking at both the state and the federal level here. So first you'll note that the agendas have not changed much between this year and last year, which is a reflection of not only these turbulent times, but also the necessity of these recommendations. 
the pandemic has continued to expose and exacerbate our challenges um, and have really highlighted the importance of making these fundamental policy changes to ensure that local governments can fund infrastructure and services that their residents require um, and that really our transportation system can continue to move people and goods across our region efficiently. Second, you'll see that these documents are really driven by our policy research and system and prioritize systemic change and how the region funds government to provide those services and infrastructure. So while 2050 makes dozens of recommendations at the state and federal level, um, you know, staff reviews comments uh, and comments on hundreds of bills each year. These agendas represent the most important steps for regional policy, not only for the next year, but the changes that we need to make in the next decade um, or so. So when staff set out to revise these agendas and make connections to the region and our response to COVID, I challenged them to include stronger policy, um, stronger language around equity, infrastructure investment, um, tax policy, uh, core parts of CMAP's mission. And so um, we also wanted to really make sure that we were making a strong statement about the support for our transit partners as they provide vital services to those who need it the most, like our essential workers. All while at the same time continuing to make these critical investments in our region's infrastructure. So finally, I'll just note that um, these documents will span two-year election cycles rather than how CMAP has historically made annual agenda documents available. Obviously, we will come to you if any of these priorities change in the near term, but um, you know, I think that the two-year cycle will benefit us and, and provide some additional focus. So policy change isn't easy, especially during these times, but we're committed to moving forward on these recommendations contained in the 2050 plan and our policy research. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Anthony and Tim to go over the recommendations at, at a high level in our state and federal agendas. Thank you very much, Erin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Safali. I work for Gordon in the Government Affairs Group here at CMAP. Um, you are all pretty familiar with the recommendations contained in this document um, and the agendas in general, but I want to briefly add some context to the state legislative agenda, as well as the internal legislative agenda development, as well as the ONTO 2050 legislative framework and the capital funding principles are policy-driven documents that connect the agency's research to the legislative process. The Work and the capital principles allow us to react to major policy and revenue proposals based on the research and recommendations contained in ONTO 2050. The agendas are more active documents. They identify opportunities to implement major recommendations from ONTO 2050 based on the conversations happening at the state level. In the wake of COVID, many recommendations haven't changed, but the urgency has become more pronounced. Uh, next slide, please. With that in mind, the following items comprise CMAP's legislative agenda for the 102nd Illinois General Assembly. CMAP's committed to supporting transparent, equitable, performance-based capital programming, um, collecting and supporting the data needed to support decision-making and accountability. And we're looking for more tools to do good planning work, especially here at CMAP and across the state. Um, another agenda item is reforming tax policy to strengthen communities. Uh, transportation recommendation of enhancing transportation revenues to fully fund a multimodal system that works better for everyone. And of course, allocate funds for all comprehensive regional planning activities undertaken by CMAP. We, we lost them. Have lost Anthony. So let me just, uh, I'll, I'll follow up on this slide here. So just in terms of next steps, the 102nd uh, Illinois General Assembly begins today. Um, and so it looks like the state um, budget address will happen on Wednesday, February 17th. And then we've already begun collecting and analyzing legislation. So I think um, following referral to substantive com committees, definitely bring these analysis back here, um, especially those, those bills that impact on 2050 and most closely related to our work. Gordon, did I cover all of that the right way? I see you popped up on screen. Yeah, you, you did, Aaron. Thank you very much. No, yeah, um, sorry for the uh, disruption there, but 
Um, you, you all have seen these documents in the past, so there's nothing, as Anthony said, that was really new or um, changed dramatically. Um, we are you know, continuing to monitor legislation as it uh, advances through the General Assembly's process. Um, and we will continue to bring these uh, those bills to you um, as we see um, their importance to the to the region. Um, and so, yeah, that that pretty much covers it. I might have some uh, closing comments after Tim gets done, but I'll kick it over to Tim. Nice. Thank you, uh, Gordon. And hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Tim McMahon and I work on our federal affairs team here at CMAP. Uh, I just want to provide a brief overview of our federal legislative agenda for this upcoming Congress. Similar to the state agenda, the main changes that were made to the federal agenda included incorporating language that addresses COVID-19, uh, provides a greater focus on equity, as Aaron mentioned, and incorporates recommendations that reflect CMAP's core implementation focus areas of transportation, climate, and regional economic competitiveness. Actually, you could turn to the next slide, thank you. Uh, at the beginning of this document, you'll find the shared regional principles for COVID relief and recovery that were crafted with regional input last year and were shared with the board last year. One of the main priorities here, uh, which is yet to happen at the federal level, is additional fiscal relief across all of the levels of government in the form of direct and state and local aid. Uh, the principles also ask for continued and increased support for transit, broader eligibility uh, for relief funds, and a focus on investments that are timely, performance-based, and will account for resiliency in mitigating climate change. So next on the agenda are the surface transportation reauthorization recommendations. Uh, which everyone here uh, is familiar with. This includes calls for sustainable revenues for our transportation system, strengthening transit, reforming funding to achieve national performance goals, a greater role for regions in programming funds, uh, reducing transportation emission and, uh, emissions and climate adaptation, uh, using emerging technologies to improve mobility and safety, and lastly, recommendations for national uh, freight policy. Uh, then if you move on, the final four sections of the agenda cover CMAP's recommendations for climate and the environment, uh, improving data transparency at the federal level, and promoting affordable housing options and policies. And then um, as well as the last recommendation there, improving economic and workforce growth to advance equity through increased coordination uh, with our federal partners. Uh, next slide, please. So the next steps here are upon a board approval at next month's meeting, we'll distribute this agenda to our congressional partners in the region. It will also be used for our biannual congressional staff briefing, and we'll use it as a reference point as we conduct legislative analysis and provide technical assistance throughout the upcoming session of Congress as potential COVID relief packages and hopefully an infrastructure bill are considered. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Gordon uh, for Gordon, any closing comments and then uh, any questions on either the state or federal agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Tim and Anthony. Uh, just, I don't know that we cover this first, but this is uh, a discussion item this, uh, this month. Um, we will bring it back to you for approval next month, but if there are any questions, we'd be happy to try to address them at this time. There are questions, uh, Gordon. Just a question for Gordon, and maybe this is Aaron too, Jerry, Karen Darch here. Yeah. Uh, just wondered if we are, if CMAP will be looking at, because this um, will pertain to sort of the tax policy question and community assistance, um, a subject near and dear to Frank Beals Hart and my own and other people's, I'm sure, but um, whether we're going to track with the new um, internet sales tax changes for 2020 and the sales tax that will be um, received by each community because of those home deliveries. Um, I don't know how much of that is all worked out now, but that certainly could really um, change the face of some of the way sales tax um, is received in, in communities. New people may be receiving it who never have before. Those who have been may lose it. So. Um, just that, just throwing that out there, because I think that'll be an important thing to understand as we look at legislation and move forward. 
Absolutely. And that is certainly, I feel like a total nerd saying it near and dear to our hearts as well. I know we've been itching to get our hands on the data and understand where and how that distribution is um, impacting communities across the region or not, right? There could be some good anticipated consequences and there could be some things that we just hadn't anticipated. So I anticipate <laughs> that we'll have some, uh, once we get our hands on some of that data, we'll, we'll continue to, to bring that to you and, and help figure out what, you know, how it's working. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, question, and, and I know uh, uh, the uh, Illinois Municipal League in, in putting out quarterly reports, uh, the local use tax, which is really the, uh, I think, the uh, standard for seeing increases in additional revenues because of uh, internet sales, is one indicator of, of, of uh, the movement of sales tax to that market. Uh, but Gordon, also, I, it appears that the state of Illinois Department of Transportation, uh, even with what's happened over the last year, continues to fund uh, uh, programs and certainly the additional monies that went to municipalities. Uh, I, I'm gathering that revenue has been, re continues to recover and that they have no plans to cut out any further uh, capital funds programs with local governments, correct? Uh, that's a question I am not prepared to answer, but um, we could definitely do some check and error and I don't know if you have a response. I I think we've, we've looked at that and, you know, based on our conversations, I think the cuts that IDOT is looking to make are largely on the, their operations side and not on the capital expenditure side. So I think, you know, the question remains, you know, the bond sales that'll happen, but I, I, I believe that they are committed to continuing to make sure those dollars get out um, to, to communities as they've made that commitment. Although uh, the first question about administration or operation of IDOT, I think we've we've been concerned that they, they are understaffed presently and uh, how they're going to address that issue going forward if, if in fact they're going to have to reduce uh, budgets uh, on uh, direct employees or whether or not they will increase uh, contracting of, of some of those uh, uh, pro, you know, uh, uh, programming areas where you know delays continue. Yeah, I imagine that'll come up tomorrow at the policy committee meeting as well. Please bring that up. Yes. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Uh, any other business before the board? I remind the executive committee members when we adjourn, you can uh, log off and then log back on uh, on the executive committee to uh, on the agenda that allows you to click into the go to meeting. So please do that once you get off here to we'll, we'll get that uh, committee meeting going very quickly. Uh, the meeting is open to the public comments. Happy New Year to you, Mayor Bennett. It's Garland Armstrong calling and Heather, how you doing? Very good, Garland. All right, Heather? just want just want to comment and tell you that we finally got the forms for the Des Moines Housing Authority. It came this past Saturday in the mail, and then they want us to see a video of it. So since we have having problems with our iPhones, you know, seeing the video of the Des Moines Housing Authority, but today one of our interns, she'll help us today with it. So once we look at it, then we'll tell you all about it. And then once we get that confirmation, we'll tell you, the move. We finally got it in the mail. It's been taking so long for it for them to respond, but they finally responded to us in the mail. So we got it. That's good. Did you had a birthday over the weekend or last holiday, right? Yep. She had it on New Year's Day. I New did. Year's. Okay. Hi Happy there. Hello. I'm excited too about moving to Des Moines. Well, very good. Any other comments? All right, uh, with that in mind, our next meeting will be February 10th. Same way, we will continue to uh, do this virtual. Uh, any change, we'll let you know. With that in mind, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Darge. Second, Diane. All those in favor will signify by a vote of aye. 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 Motion carried, meeting adjourned. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye, Heather. Bye.